And they said, because we know that black and brown women don't get the same treatment in the delivery room, in the delivery room that white women do. So we are going to see to it that every one, woman who comes to us will be treated fairly during the delivery of her child. Think about that. For the love of God, we need to think about that. So first, I want to say thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for mu so much for inviting me. For those that don't know who you are, could you give us just a quick description of who you are and what you've done? Sure. I'm a rural school teacher from Osage, Iowa. I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. I, I split my class, my third grade class, according to the color of their eyes, on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed for the purpose of helping them to understand what was causing Martin Luther King Jr. to be in the street and what was in the minds of those who caused him to be shot. What was the motivation? Like what, how did you come up with that scenario? Why that I was scenario? Born in, I was born in 1933. That was the year that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt came to power in their respect, respective countries. I watched my father ranting about the way Adolf Hitler was behaving from 1933 until the end of the war, the Second World War in 1945. He was absolutely furious. And one of the ways Adolf Hitler decided who went into the gas chamber was eye color. If you had brown eyes, you obviously weren't a member of the Aryan race, which was a made up word. Aryan was a made up word. There's no Aryan race. But if you had brown eyes, you couldn't be a member of that race because the Aryan race was made up of blue eyed blonde hair, fair skinned people. So on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I thought, wait a minute. I watched the people who interviewed black people that night after the killing, and I heard the most ridiculous questions out of what I thought were intelligent, pale-faced males. It was just awful. And as and when Martin Luther King Jr. had been one of our heroes of the month in February, along with George Washington, who owned slaves, Abraham Lincoln, who was our first black president, admittedly black president, he was a Melungeon, he, he was part black, part white, and part Cherokee Indian. And he said during his presidency, Africans should go back to the land they came from. So he wasn't a, he wasn't a great person as far as civil rights were concerned. But those two, those were two of our heroes of the month. And Davy Crockett, who died trying to kill off Mexicans as they tried to take up over part of the land that we had stolen from the native inhabitants. So it was a perfect it, it was a perfect hook on which to hang a lesson on discrimination and the ignorance of judging people on the basis of physical characteristics over which they have absolutely no control. What kind of backlash did you get from that <laughs> <laughs> at that time? What kind you of You don't have time. You don't have time to hear all the backlash I got. I was totally, totally out. I, I, I was, I was absolutely declared not a perfect person and not a person to be around by the people, most of the people in that community. The teachers were absolutely vicious about it. I got a lot of attention from newsmakers because it went on television. It got my, a friend of mine saw what I was doing. And then the uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation came and made a film in my classroom the following year. And the year after that, ABC made a film in my classroom. And of course, all those people coming in and making films about one third grade teacher really set people's teeth on edge. So I got a lot of a lot of ugly ugliness to me and I didn't mind the ugliness to me. But what I did mind was the ugliness to my children. Right. They were bitten, beaten, they were spit upon, they were called names. And after several years after that, I think two or three years after that, uh, one of the high school teachers came to me at a, a school meeting and said, educators meeting and said, Jane, you've got to get your kids out of this school. I said, why? She said, because these teachers are trying to destroy your children. And indeed they were. So we moved to Osage, which was 17 miles away. My kids didn't have to go to school there any morning, but I, anymore, but I continued to teach there. So the, so the abuse where my children were concerned came to a pretty much of a halt. But where I was concerned, they were even more angry at me because I had gotten out of their clutches my children whom they were abusing on a daily basis. And you also mentioned that you've gotten death threats before? Oh yeah, I got lots of those. <laughs> I had a whole whole stack of death threats and, and uh, suggestions that I should die. 
and I was going to keep them and write a book and put the bad ones on the left side and the, right, the good ones on the right side. And then I thought, if you do that, you'll be giving these fools publicity. Don't do that. So I threw them all away and figured, okay, that's as much as these mean to me. Death threats don't bother me anymore now. Uh, I, when I go on a college campus and they're all these three little boys in the second or third row and they're doing this with their fingers and pointing their finger at me like this. And I know, and I stop and I say, look, fellas, I know what you're talking about. I know you'd like to see me dead because of what I do to decrease the level of racism in this country. You can kill me. It won't bother me now. My son and my husband, my oldest son and my husband are both gone and I will be with them. So you go ahead, have fun with it. But remember this, if you kill me because I'm trying to decrease the level of racism in the United States of America, you might make a hero out of me and you might have to spend the rest of your lives celebrating Jane Elliott Day once a year. Now, do you want to do that? And then they'll they make a cross with, oh, no, no, no. I say, then shut up and listen while I'm talking. And they shut up and listen. But every student of color, every male of color in that room has spotted the ones that are doing that. And when those three guys, before I finish my remarks in that evening, they step over the back of their seats, get through that group, that row, and run down the aisle to get out of the building before the meeting is over. And I know why they're running. They're running from, you live with the consequences of your behavior, and they're running from what could very well happen to them on that campus as a result of what they did that night. Goalie gummies are all gluten-free, vegan, non-GMO, unfiltered, and of course, gelatin-free. You can use my code DUCOYT for better health today. And that's what should happen to them. Those young right. black males should catch up with them and teach them a valuable lesson. And the most valuable lesson they could teach them is this. See this hand, on your hand you have, to put your hand up, look at your hand. On your hand you have five fingers. The thumb, these are, represent the five, what we call races in this country. They are really color groups. The white one is the thumb because that white people are a numerical minority all over the world. White people represent less than 15 to 18% of the world's population. The first finger is the black race. The red middle finger is the brown race. We are all members of the brown race. The fourth finger is the yellow race and the fifth finger is the red race, which does not exist. Now, separately, they aren't worth much, but you bring them all together and you've created a fist. Right. You can use that power. All of a sudden, they all have power. When they're together, they all have power. You, you are bothered when I point my middle finger at you. Then it like means something. To me, it means brown race. We are all members of this. And when we get us all together, we have the power in this group to break through the walls of racism if we choose to. We choose not to. It's time for us to choose to break the wall, break through the wall of racism, and put a stop to this nonsense. That's powerful. I think, I think this is powerful. This is much more powerful than this. So what we have to remember is this constitutes the human race. This is the human race. We are all members of the human race. There are no black, white, red, yellow, or brown, or red or yellow people. There are brown people, but this constitutes a whole human race. It is powerful. And we need to use that powerful to stop separating us according to eye color or according to skin color. This makes no sense. Never has, never will, never did and didn't start until the Spanish Inquisition. The word race, meaning a specific group of people, came out of France in 1580. Did you know that? No. That's how recently the word race has meant a specific group of people. People will say to me, it's been going on forever. I say, no, by the gods of war, it hasn't been going on forever. It was invent invented. The idea of separating people according to the color of their skin was invented during the Spanish Inquisition, Torquemada decided he couldn't see, he, he, they were killing people that they thought were Christians in order to bring them to, to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. He found out he'd killed a bunch of Christians. And then he decided you can't tell what a person's religion is by looking at them. So he had to find a way to decide who deserved to die. And he came upon, came upon the two colors, black and white. White is for people who are less colorful, whose, whose skin is less colorful, and white is the color of goodness and purity, according to the dictionary. Black is for those who are more colorful, and black is the color of savagery and evil. Now tell me why people are willing to be called those two names in 2023. It makes no sense. It is the height of idiocy. 
to still be, we, when he set us upon, he, black and white, those are polar opposites. As long as you use those two terms to describe people, groups of people, you are setting yourself up to fail as a society. And we are failing. Right now, we are in a terrible situation because for four years, we had a president who not only went along with that, he, he encouraged it, he praised it, he exemplified it. And now it's going to take us a, probably 10 to 20 years to get over what he created in those four years. And what's the name that you gave him? <laughs> <laughs> I call him T-Rump because he's like Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yes. He thinks like a dinosaur. He has a face that looks like a rump. He has a mouth that looks like an anal aperture. And when he <laughs> opens it, he vocalizes excrement. Donald Trump knocked the L out of the word Republican. It has now become, it has now become the party repugic, Republican because the pubic area is the only thing those Republic, Republicans are thinking about right now as they try to force women, pale-faced women, whom they call white women, to have more babies so that we will not, we white people, <coughs> white people, will not lose our numerical majority in the United States of America. They're scared to death because they know that within 30 years, what we call white people will have become a numerical minority in this country. And closing the Planned Parenthood clinics was part of, part of their campaign to force women to have babies. Make no mistake about this. If a woman wants an abortion, she will find a way to get one. That's it right. may ca cause her death, but some women would rather die than produce a child. They have a right to make that decision. They should be able to make it legally and in the hands of a competent physician. But oh no, we are going to make white women have more babies. And I guess if a black woman decides to have a baby, she's gonna be lucky if it leaves the delivery room. And if you don't believe the, me on that, then you need to read this book, Policing the Womb by Michelle Goodwin. Have you read this book? I have not. Oh my God, you've got to read this book, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood. You've got to read this book and give it to every woman that you know, because it says in here plainly, this, this refusing to allow women to have abortions applies only to white women. Black women will be encouraged, and they have been encouraged over the years, to have abortions. And you need to read what happens to black women in delivery rooms. It's very different from what happens to white women. I worked with a group of, of women who were going to be delivering babies in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Probably 40 of them, all different kinds of colors. And I said to them, look, why did you ask me to come here and talk to, why did you midwives ask me to come here and talk to you about the delivery room. I'm not, I have no, I know nothing about medicine. And they said, because we know that black and brown women don't get the same treatment in the delivery room, in the delivery room that white women do. So we are going to see to it that every woman, woman who comes to us will be treated fairly during the delivery of her child. Think about that. For the love of God, we need to think about that. Black women are afraid to go to the delivery room because they aren't sure they'll come out or their child will come out alive. And if you don't believe that, you read them. You need to read Michelle Goodwin's book, Policing the Womb. It's really but scary. That, yeah, yeah, that is more than scary. It is terrifying, particularly in view of the fact that it's true. Mm -hmm. If it were somebody's imagination, that would be different. But if you look at hospital records, you look at delivery room records, you look at the records of uh, physicians in this country, you're going to find some really unpleasant facts, facts that we would rather not face, but we better face them because <laughs> here's one of the reasons we have to face them. Black women saved our democracy two years ago. They went to the polls in huge numbers and voted against, they didn't vote for Biden, they voted against Donosaurus T. Rump. Right. They saved our democracy by doing it. Now, Joe Biden, if he runs again, We'll get saved. He, they will save our country again, I'm sure, because black women know more than I will ever know about racism. They've forgotten more since breakfast than I'm ever going to learn. But they are not allowed to stand up and say the things that I say because people will accuse them of pushing their own agenda. I don't have an agenda other than the fact that we are all members of the same race. There's only one race of people on the face of the earth. It's the human race. And we are all 
whole, whole, what's the word? <laughs> I'm afraid that people, when I say we're all homo sapiens, <laughs> drives the, drives these boys with their with their we will not Jews will not replace us things. Mm. It drives them crazy because they think I'm saying homosexual. I'm not. I'm <laughs> saying homo sapiens. And everybody should read Harari's book Sapiens. Have you read it? No, ma'am. Oh my God! You've got to read Harari's book Sapiens. S a p i e n s. It is just remarkable in what that man knows. And the way he presents it, and there are points in that book where he bursts out laughing, because it is all what we have been doing is so ridiculous, and so childlike, and so ignorant. It's just the book is just wonderful. And now I'm reading his next book, A Brief History of Tomorrow, Homo Deus. Everybody has to read this book. It's hard work because for some reason, this this guy who has who hit his publisher thinks you have to read thick. Write it on thick, thick pieces of paper, and this book probably weighs fifteen pounds. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's it's full of good information. But he could have put it in paperback so more people would read it. This is hard work reading this book, not intellectually, not mentally, physically. This is hard work. So earlier you said that you were born in the nineteen thirties, right? Nineteen thirty-three. Thirty-three. Okay. My biggest question is how did you find out all this information during that time, especially during a time where racism was so prevalent? How did you find the information that you needed? I didn't find information that I needed. All we had was a radio and we didn't have electricity then, so it had to be a battery radio. So my father would turn that radio on in the morning and he would listen to the news and we listened to the news every day. And then we, on Saturday, we could go to the movie to four and a half miles away, and I would watch the, the newsreels. And every every year, every day, every time, there was something about the Nazi soldiers goose-stepping past the Brandenburg Gate. And it was a horrible sight, and it was an ugly sight, and my father was angry for those 12 years because of what Hitler was doing. I listened to that over and over and over, his anger at what was happening. I was raised by a father who said, don't bring any pickaninnies into my house as grandchildren, but also said, you can't judge a book by its cover or a man by the color of his skin. And he believed that. He didn't always act upon it, but there were no people of color in my community. It was an all white community. So that we got, and then I went to a rural school and social studies was anti-social studies because all the things that were done that, that were exciting and important and clever were done by white males, according to our social studies. Right. The book I learned to read was the Dick and Jane Scott Horsman series. And the only thing integrated in that book was the dog Spot, which was white with black spots. We didn't, all the things we learned about people of color were, we could kill them, we could enslave them, we could treat them as we chose to because they were less than human, less human than we were. That's what social studies was then. And it's what it is now. Make no mistake about this. The heroes in your social studies book, those social studies books should be called anti-social books because that's what they are. They teach racism on a daily basis. And, and my father said, this is wrong, this is wrong. This is, and he was, but he didn't want my, his children to marry out of their race. Well, my daughter married a Saudi Arabian and she brought their baby home, their little girl, baby teeny tiny baby and put it in my father's arms and my father looked at that and said this is the most beautiful child i've ever seen and then he looked at my daughter my anglo-american daughter and her saudi arabian husband and said that's a good cross <laughs> because my father was a farmer and what he saw was two people who were very very different but had created produced something absolutely beautiful and he said that's a good cross i'll never forget that and I'll never forget the first time my father saw the film that was made in my classroom. That was a film the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation made the, the, the first year after, not the year of the exercise, but the, set, the next year with my second group of third graders. I showed that to my father and he and my mother and I sat and watched it together, all just the three of us. And after it was over, my about 61 year old father stood up, took his red handkerchief out of the back pocket of his blue bib overalls, blew his nose, wiped his eyes and said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. 
Now, after that, no psychologist, no sociologist, nobody who knows all about, all about these things is ever going to con convince me that what I did with those children was a bad thing to do. And I've done it with children of all ages in many, place, many places in the United States and in other countries for the last 50 years. I've been doing the same thing. And it works the same way every time.